Logical Self-Defense by Ralph H. Johnson and J. Anthony Blair of University of Windsor. Introduction. Much has been written about the consumer in our society, but little has been done to extend that viewpoint to the area of argumentation about social, political, and other topics of everyday concern. As citizens, we are showered with persuasive appeals. Pick up any newspaper or magazine, turn on the radio or TV, or check the mail that comes to the door. The teachers' union, the school board, the city council, irate taxpayers, they're all trying to gain our support for higher salaries or for lower salaries, for a strike or for an injunction to block a strike, for city core redevelopment or for rezoning for a suburban shopping mall. Walkathons want us to walk, bikeathons want us to bike, telethons want us to phone in a pledge to support this or that cause. Your political party wants you to canvass for a local candidate. Your senator wants you to fill out a questionnaire. A pollster wants your opinion about issues in the upcoming election. Last night's editorial suggested that pornography is demeaning to women and dehumanizes men. Is it true? Some mothers write letters to the editor favoring abortion on demand. Other mothers write urging that abortion be outlawed. Who is right? We are urged to get out and jog. We're implored to quit smoking. Is a home of your own an unachievable dream? What are we to think and do about all these pleas and appeals? Groups and individuals are incessantly vying for our support, for their way of seeing things, for our acceptance of their views of what is true, important, or worth doing. The list of topics varies. The point is that we are consumers of beliefs and values as well as products. An important question thus emerges. How good are our buying habits? Some arguments are damaged goods. Buying a bad argument can, depending on the situation, do a person more harm than buying a defective CD player. Assuming that your buying habits are in need of improvement and that you are willing to work to develop better ones, assuming too that you are not so naive as to think that you can listen to this symphony of persuasive appeals without being influenced by them, what are your options? What resources exist to help you sort out the good from the less worthy? How can you equip yourself to distinguish between good and bad persuasive appeals? We think you need to become familiar with and able to take part in the practice of argumentation. This activity has its origins in ancient Greek society of the 5th century BC. Since then, it has been a mainstay of intellectual culture, aiding generations of inquirers in pursuit of truth. Although our society has become image-oriented, argumentation is no cultural dinosaur. On the contrary, the practice of insisting on good reasons for believing and doing remains essential to the expansion of knowledge into a free and democratic society. We are convinced that argumentation is a powerful tool for assessing the value of the multitude of messages beamed at us, and that with its aid, we will be better able to distinguish the good reasons for believing and acting from the bad ones. We hope that by working through this book you will acquire, to a significant extent, the knowledge, skills, and habits of mind you need to analyze arguments and so to believe and act on ever more solid grounds. Section 1 the Basic Tools Chapter 1. Identifying Arguments In this chapter, we introduce the concept of argument that will be used in this book by distinguishing it from opinion. We then suggest ways of identifying arguments that are made in the pros of everyday settings. Opinion versus Argument There are few sure things in life anymore, but one of them is that people will always have opinions on almost every conceivable topic, from how to save the environment to how to save your soul, from what City Hall should do about waste disposal to what Israel and the Arab states should do to secure an enduring peace in the Mideast, from whether it will rain tomorrow to what makes a song a classic. In fact, there are opinions about opinions. For example, everyone is entitled to their opinion. By opinion, we mean simply belief or attitude. For example, suppose that you and a friend have just seen the classic movie Casablanca for the first time. You turn to your friend and ask, Well, what do you think? Did you like it? 
What you are asking for is your friend's reaction to the movie, her first thoughts about it. Perhaps your friend says, I thought it was terrific, I loved it. That is her opinion. In this case, a value judgment. But opinions can also be judgments of fact. In my opinion, that big bird is an eagle. Predictions. If you ask my opinion, the consensus will be that Navratilova had the greatest tennis career of the 20th century. Or statements of faith. In my opinion, God looks after those who are pure of heart. Opinion. Any belief or attitude held or expressed by anyone. People express their opinions in all sorts of contexts. They may do so simply to be sociable, rotten weather, isn't it? Or because they think others want to or should know their opinion. Oh dear, that jacket does not go with those slacks. Others, like TV commentators or newspaper columnists, get paid for their opinions. Some opinions are instant reactions, expressed in the heat of the moment or without deliberation. These opinions reveal more about their owner's state of mind at the time than they do about the subject. Others have been considered or thought through and convey reliable information about the subject. Physicians' medical opinions about their patient's health and attorneys' legal opinions about their client's legal positions are supposed to have this latter feature. The following is a clear example of an opinion, stated in a letter to a newspaper. Thank you for your movie critic, Judy Gerstel. We can depend on her for a good appraisal of movies. Her critiques are usually right on. We prefer, however, the 10-point movie rating system you used to use to the current 4-point system. Marge and Mike Miller. The Millers say they tend to agree with Judy Gerstel's movie reviews and express gratitude to the paper for using her as a movie reviewer. They also express their disagreement with the paper's new four-point movie rating system. These are their opinions, period. Is Judy Gerstel really a good movie reviewer? Is the ten-point rating system better than the four-point system? The Millers present no grounds for agreeing with their opinions. Can anyone assess opinions? Sure. Opinions can be thoroughly thought-out judgments or vague impressions. They can be wise or foolish. They can be well-grounded or utterly baseless. In a TV commercial for Gallo Wines, a character says, Isn't I just like it good enough? Maybe it is with wine, but when you get your doctor's opinion about whether your arm is broken or you're pregnant, I just have a feeling is emphatically not good enough. What is an opinion worth? That's partly a matter of its function and partly a matter of whose opinion it is. If a local columnist is successful in getting people to think about a particular topic by expressing an opinion, even stridently, then the purpose may be achieved. A doctor's diagnosis or medical opinion of an athlete's injury will normally be more valuable than will that of a teammate. Logicians are interested in arguments that are launched by expressions of opinion. That is, they are interested in the opinions plus the reasons or evidence advanced to support those opinions. The simple statement of an opinion can be the first step toward the construction of an argument. Unfortunately, for many people, it's also the last. A further step is taken when, in addition to offering an opinion, the person goes on to offer reasons for it. What makes the citing of reasons or grounds for an opinion preferable to just stating it is that the reasons offer us a possible basis for agreeing with the stated opinion. By looking at how well the reasons support it, we can see whether we too should share the opinion. Opinions lead to argument in a couple of ways. When an opinion is questioned or challenged, a natural response is to look for the grounds or evidence that support it, that constitute reasons to believe it. Such grounds constitute an argument for the opinion. Alternatively, when two opinions clash, the question naturally arises as to which is true or more plausible. Producing the reasons for preferring one of two conflicting opinions constitutes producing an argument in support of that opinion. When people engage in a dispute, contesting each other's opinions, sometimes heatedly, we say they are having an argument. The discussion may not go beyond just repeating the disagreement. Pro, I really like Casablanca. Con, I don't particularly. Pro, what? It's a terrific movie. It's a classic. Con, maybe, but I can't get excited about it. Often the discussion will go beyond the mere expression of disagreement, and one side will ask for the other's reasons. What don't you like about it? What is there to it? And both sides may then try to state their reasons. 
What they put into words may be what led them to their opinions, or it may be an after-the-fact defense of it. The expression of opinions functions as a natural starting point for the construction of reasoned support for them. When people state the grounds or reasons for their opinions, they are giving arguments for them, and these reasons are arguments that they or someone else makes or produces. Starting out by having an opinion, the disputants thus might turn to making arguments. Clearly, then, the word argument has at least two uses, two senses of argument. One, an interaction, usually verbal and usually between two or more people, that is normally occasioned by a difference of opinion. Two, what someone makes or formulates, reasons or evidence, as grounds or support for an opinion, the basis for believing it. To get the benefit of any arguments associated with opinions, you have to be able to identify the expressions of opinion that are accompanied to some extent by reasons, and so can serve as starters for argument and to distinguish them from mere opinion, i.e. opinion unattended by any attempt at support. Let's look at a couple of examples to bring this contrast home. A few years ago, the Los Angeles Times ran a story about a trial in which a United States District Court judge was quoted of having used the slur to refer to homosexuals. This story prompted several readers to write letters to the editor. Here is what one wrote. So Judge Hawk referred to gays as slur. It seems the crooks, weirdos, and rapists are all looking for acceptance from those of us who follow the straight and narrow, and frankly, I'm sick of it. If someone is caught in the act of committing a crime, shoot him with a gun, not a taser. This writer surely expressed his opinion. His reaction was intense, but what was he trying to say? Was he claiming that gay men are crooks, weirdos, and rapists, and that therefore it's all right to call them insulting names? Or was he just angry about some particular recent cases where he thought the accused had expected approval just because they were homosexual? His comments were not very well thought through. He seemed to want to defend the judge's use of the slur, but we aren't given any clear reasons why it is defensible. The tone here is certainly strident, anticipating disagreement, but the contents leave little room for interplay or evaluation. As far as argumentation is concerned, this expression of opinion is a non-starter. Contrast the opinion in two with the next one, also about Judge Hawke's comment. Judges should be fair and honest to handle all proceedings in a just and unbiased way. If Judge Hawke has such prejudices against homosexuals, how many of what other prejudices does he have? How could people of the United States expect Hawk and judges like him to be fair and give out sentences or unbiased opinions when obviously he has prejudices against certain people? The second writer's opinion was that Hawk was biased, an opinion based on the judge's reference to homosexuals, but she went on from this opinion to express another view in the form of wondering whether this judge can be fair. This expression of opinion has both structure and motion. It is headed in a direction, toward a goal, and it is not hard to see roughly what that goal is, opposition to Judge Hawk or to any judge with prejudices. The support for this opinion, that judges should be fair and honest, and that prejudiced judges cannot give out fair sentences or opinions, we can evaluate logically, unlike the first case, which had no clear structure or direction. And there is another important difference. Perhaps both writers sought to persuade us, but the second writer was more rational. She gave us organized reasons. The first writer gave us a jumbled, unformed reaction. From the presentation of opinion in the second letter, though not from the first, it is possible to make a reasonable guess at the argument the second writer intended to make. By an argument that is made, we mean reasons that someone has collected, which that person thinks show that another claim is true, or at least deserves consideration. The reasons might consist of claims the person making the argument thinks up, borrows from other people, or gathers through research. The person thinks that anyone who accepts the reasons is thereby committed to accepting the claim alleged to follow from them. Thus, for example, if you accept that today is Tuesday, then you are led to accept that tomorrow is Wednesday. 
Suppose we make the argument that Yvonne should be given the winner's prize because he won the race and the prize should go to the person who won the race. In making that argument, our thinking is that if you agree both that winning the race is the only basis needed for deserving the winner's prize and that Yvonne won the race, then you are led to accept that Yvonne deserves the winner's prize. So an argument someone makes is a collection of claims or statements that point the way from the acceptance of one group of claims to the acceptance of the remaining claim. Because the second expression of opinion about Judge Hawke's ruling is much closer to fitting this definition than is the first one, we want to distinguish between the two. The first is pure opinion, while the second, which gives reasons but is not very clear about exactly what those reasons are supposed to show, is what we'll dub, for want of a better term, proto-argument. The expressions of opinion we call proto-arguments differ from arguments proper more in terms of their structure than in terms of their purpose. In an argument, as product, a certain structure is evident. One, a clear opinion or claim. Two, support for that opinion. And three, the path by which the support is supposed to lead to the opinion. It is the absence of two or three or both which identifies a proto-argument and the absence of two that marks mere opinion. Yet both proto-argument and fully explicit argument make an attempt to persuade rationally by dispensing reasons. The citing of reasons is a distinguishing ideal of constructed arguments because there are other methods of persuasion, other tactics that people use to attempt to induce belief and action. There is the appeal to one's blind faith and authority. This is your leader speaking. There is the appeal to force and fear. I have a gun. Give me the money. There is the appeal to one's vanity or insecurities. Someone with your obvious intelligence can see that our policies are clearly right-minded. There is the appeal to personal loyalty. We've been friends for a long time. Believe me when I say I didn't do it or to group loyalties, all good environmentalists will oppose this bill. Such methods of inducing belief or influencing actions may, in some situations, be legitimate. A four-year-old child is generally not going to be persuaded rationally to keep from running into the street, so one may have to resort to some combination of force and fear to keep the child out of the roadway. However, as we become mature and able to reason things out for ourselves, we are quite capable both of persuading others rationally and being so persuaded ourselves. Arguments have a prominent role in this enterprise. A constructed argument, then, is a piece of linguistic communication, whether written or spoken, with a certain structure, support and claim, and function, rational support or grounding. The requisite structure and function cannot be rigidly specified. So far as structure goes, people's arguments will tend to have tacit or unexpressed parts, and will vary in how clearly ordered they are. Argumentative expression ranges from relatively sketchy forms to those elaborated with systematic thoroughness and in fine detail. Most of the arguments we will be dealing with fall somewhere between these extremes. The first thing to do in appraising arguments is to get clear about what the argument is, just what is offered as support and how it is intended to support the claim concluded. More about that in the next chapter. So far as function goes, probably the most frequent use of arguments is to try to persuade another or others to accept or agree with the arguer's opinion. But arguments can have other purposes. For example, they can be used to investigate a hypothesis by seeing what reasons might be given to support a claim, or to understand what one is committed to in accepting some claim by seeing what other claims it leads to or supports, or to reinforce people's opinions by giving giving them further reasons for believing what they are already disposed to believe and answering objections or criticisms. We say more about some of these topics in chapter 12. The sense of argument used in this book. By argument, we mean a claim, together with one or more sets of reasons offered by someone to support that claim. The claim will be an opinion or point of view that someone has asserted and is defending. Any sentence expressing an opinion in that role expresses what is called a conclusion of the argument. Sentences expressing reasons or evidence put forward to support any conclusion express what are called the premises of the argument. 
Offering reasons to support a claim amounts to trying to show that it is true or believable. Sometimes the word argument is used to refer just to the premises, as in, he had a good point, but the arguments he used to support it were weak. In the early part of this book, we deal with arguments that are not elaborated very extensively. We concentrate on what we call snippets, that is, very short arguments or segments of longer passages. This focus makes it easier for you to develop your logical skills and sensibility initially. We began this chapter by talking about expressions of opinion, as in some instances the preliminary step toward argument. But making an argument with a single reason for accepting a claim will usually be merely a preliminary to formulating a fully worked out argument, which we will call a case. Let us explain. Disagreements about controversial matters are usually what lead people to make arguments. Making a well-rounded argument in support of a contending point of view in a controversy requires us not only to give arguments for it, but to deal with the known objections to those arguments and with the arguments that seem to show that the position itself is wrong. For example, an argument that consists of a few reasons in favor of capital punishment but fails to deal with the well-known objections to those reasons and does not take into consideration and respond to arguments for opposing capital punishment moves in just one of three dimensions. What is needed here is a multidimensional set of arguments that seeks to 1. give reasons or evidence for the conclusion, 2. rebut objections to those reasons, and 3. rebut arguments for the opposite viewpoint. This multidimensional set of arguments is what we have in mind by the idea of a case. In chapters 12 and 13, we have more to say about cases. In the meantime, we will mostly be considering arguments that move in only one or two of the three dimensions. Identifying the argument. We now turn to the essential preliminary stage leading to the logical appraisal of arguments. Arriving at a clear understanding of what the argument is prior to evaluating it. A physician cannot treat a disease or injury properly without diagnosing it correctly. An attorney cannot advise a client properly without knowing the precise and full particulars of the client's situation. Nor can a reasoner evaluate an argument properly without a precise understanding of what the argument is. When people talk or write, they don't always clearly signal when they intend to make their arguments. As we have noted, even when they are clearly having an argument, that is, disagreeing and disputing, they don't always make any arguments, that is, give any reasons to back up their opinions. So when interpreting what someone has said or written, we must, at the outset, make a judgment as to whether an argument has been made at all. In practice, deciding whether someone has made an argument cannot be disassociated from deciding what the constituent parts and structure of the argument are. It's like deciding whether an ad has a subliminal message. You can't decide that there's a message there without identifying what the message is. To simplify our exposition, however, we have artificially separated these two intertwined tasks. In the remainder of this chapter, we will list some indicators of the presence of an argument, compare argument with a lookalike, and offer some advice. Then, in chapter 2, we will focus on the problem of reconstruction, extracting the argument and displaying its structure. We also restrict our discussion to arguments expressed in language and for practical convenience, to examples from published written sources. The first question to ask when trying to determine whether a passage of prose might contain an argument is, why suspect there is an argument here? But there is an ambiguity in this question. On the one hand, the author might be intending to produce an argument. On the other hand, the passage might contain a set of statements that could be arranged so as to constitute an argument regardless of whether the author intended to be producing one. Either case can have two versions. In one, whether intended as an argument or not, the argument is a good one. In the second version, the argument is not a good one. And if not good as it stands, it either can be repaired or improved or is beyond help and should be abandoned. 
So which case do we have in mind in asking about a passage, is there an argument here? For our purposes, we will be trying to discern what the author had in mind. If he or she intended to make an argument, then whether it is a good argument or a bad one, and whether it can be fixed or not, we will say there is an argument in the segment of writing. In deciding whether an argument by the author is present, several different kinds of clues are available. Evidence of the author's intention. Writing or talking aims in some end or goal. Talking and writing are actions and thus performed for a purpose. Ask yourself, what was the author's purpose here? Since one of the most common reasons for making arguments is to use them to persuade others to believe something or to do something, it is helpful to ask, is the author trying to persuade some audience to accept some claim or to perform some action? Is the author trying to prove or establish some point of view? If so, what is the viewpoint or action, and what are the reasons given? Sometimes a writer is helpful enough to make her intent clear. She might say, now here is what I believe, and here is why I believe it, or some equivalent. Then you know you have an argument, and the only remaining question is what exactly the contents and structure of the argument are. What are the premises and the conclusion, and how are the premises organized? Unfortunately for readers, such explicit statements of intent are rare. In their absence, there are three principal sources of evidence to determine the author's claim and to discern the details of any argument they have produced. 1. Verbal clues. Special argument indicating expressions in the language. 2. Situational clues. The context in which the passage was written or spoken. And 3. Internal logical clues, the logical or evidentiary relations between the statements in the passage, will take up each in turn. Argument indicators. When someone writes, bat and pigeon droppings contain parasites that can be fatal to humans, so you should wear reliable respirators when you renovate buildings that might contain such droppings. The word so is a signal that the author means to be arguing. So also indicates that the claim following it is the conclusion and that the claim preceding it is a premise. When someone says you should see that movie because the mountain scenery in it is spectacular, the word because tells you that they are arguing and specifically that the statement prior to because is what they are trying to persuade you of, the conclusion, and the statement following it contains a reason they think will persuade you, the premise. Perhaps the most reliable textual clues to the author's intention to argue are these expressions that signal premises and conclusions. We have seen that they do two things at once. One, imply the presence of argument, and two, point out the argumentative roles of the sentences they are juxtaposed with. As a competent language user, you are familiar with words like so and therefore, because and since, and you know how to use them to indicate your own intentions to argue, but you might not have paid explicit attention to the way they work. As we have just illustrated, argument indicators can be divided into two groups according to the argumentative function of the clause to which they are attached. The ones we call conclusion indicators introduce clauses stating one or more of the conclusions of an argument. The ones we call premise indicators introduce clauses stating one or more of the premises of an argument. In case you happen to run across it somewhere, the grammatical label for these premise and conclusion indicators is illatives. Conclusion indicators. Therefore, thus, it follows that. So, accordingly, I conclude that. Hence, and so, my conclusion is. These are words that almost invariably introduce the clause expressing an argument's conclusion. The clearest conclusion indicator of all is therefore, which rarely fails to play this role, though there are exceptions, so you can't use it blindly. So, used as a conjunction, is a synonym of therefore. Thus, people who say, so therefore, want to leave no doubt in your mind that here comes my conclusion. Other terms that signal the presence of a conclusion by preceding it are hence, thus, and accordingly, when they are used as conjunctions. 
It follows that and I conclude that are almost invariably conclusion indicating phrases, but in conclusion usually marks the end of a piece of prose, either the last point or a final summary, and not necessarily the conclusion of an argument, that is, the claim being argued for. Consequently, sometimes indicates an argument's conclusion, but sometimes it points to something being explained, not something being argued for. We discuss the important distinction between argument and explanation later in this chapter. Premise indicators. Because, since, for, given that, granted that, for the reason that. These are words that are usually followed immediately by one or more of the premises of an argument. Since, the conjunction, not the adverb, strongly suggests that the clause following it states an argument's premise. For, the conjunction, not the preposition, sometimes indicates argument, sometimes explanation. Similarly, because marks either an explanation or an upcoming set of premises. Given that and granted that sometimes indicate premises and sometimes just introduce the conditions of something. Some references to reasons indicate the premises of arguments. Others indicate explanations. Keep an eye out for premise and conclusion indicators, together with other evidence. They can be decisive, but alone and out of context, they are like the rules of spelling. There are exceptions. Also, too often, just when you need one to indicate that an argument is intended or to cue you to the role of a particular statement in an argument, your author lets you down by failing to provide any. Context Besides going by premise and conclusion indicators, look to context to help divine the author's intentions. There is context in the sense of the habit of the communication, i.e. where you find it. In certain locations, arguments are the norm. Courts of law, legislatures, articles in scholarly and scientific journals, to name but three. In other locations, arguments are rare, for example, in lyric, poetry, pornography, comedians' routines, or primetime TV commercials, as we'll contend in Chapter 11. In between are contexts that are hospitable to arguments, yet often enough have argument-free prose. Here we'd put letters to the editor, editorials, opinion columns, political speeches, college lectures. Context can also mean the situation that is the occasion for the communication, i.e. when you find it. For example, if your local newspaper has been reporting a battle at City Hall over contracting out garbage collection to a non-union company and laying off workers in the city's unionized sanitation department, then you can bet on finding arguments in the interchanges at city council meetings and in letters and opinion and editorial columns of the paper. In general, when there is a dispute with two or more sides in contention, expect the people involved to be intending to give reasons why their particular view should prevail. Include here all the hot issues of the day. Environmental ethics, affirmative action, nuclear power, policies dealing with AIDS, biomedical ethics, business ethics, tax policies, trade and tariff policies, capital punishment, gun control, abortion, euthanasia, suicide, school board policies, foreign policy, and so on. The same holds when someone takes a public position that runs counter to the conventional wisdom, even if there isn't a public dispute about it yet. The last paragraph deserves elaboration. It seems to be a convention of communication via speech that if someone asserts something to be the case and another person questions or doubts the claim, the person making the assertion owes an account of why he or she thinks it is true. This obligation, or onus, is what is known in legal argumentation and organized debate as the burden of proof. Burden of proof. When someone asserts an opinion to which there are well-known objections, the asserter has an obligation, if it is so requested, to provide a reason for accepting the opinion. The burden of proof rule is a convention of communication, so people adept at communicating usually try to discharge their obligation by supplying the requisite support for contentious claims. So, as interpreters of prose where controversial claims are advanced, we are justified in trying to interpret the writing as containing argumentation, at least if we can do so without distorting it. 
For example, when Oliver Stone's movie, JFK, makes the implied claim that there was a conspiracy involving the FBI, the CIA, some Supreme Court justices, and other highly placed federal government officials to conceal the real facts of the assassination of President Kennedy, Mr. Stone incurs the burden of proof because his allegation is highly controversial. It's fair to interpret the movie as representing his argument in support of it. Logical structure. There is a fourth resource, besides the writer's avowed intention, premise, and conclusion indicators and contextual evidence, available for deciding whether a piece of writing is intended to be argumentative. It's logical structure. Ask yourself, can its statements readily be fitted together to form a sensible argument? Do some of them actually lend support to others? Is it easy to see how the author might have thought that some claims support others even if they don't? The point is this. If you can reconstruct from the prose an argument that someone could put forward sensibly, then you have some evidence that the author intended to be making that argument in that passage. You have to be cautious. The argument so reconstructed might be a logically bad one. We go into the standards of a good argument in chapter 3. And you don't want to attribute to someone a bad argument unless you have no choice. Why not? The reason is a general principle of interpretation called the principle of charity. Principle of charity. Provide the most favorable logical interpretation of what someone has written or said that is consistent with all the available evidence relevant to its interpretation. Unless there are special reasons for not doing so, when we communicate competently, it seems that we try to live up to certain norms. For example, we try to give accurate and relevant information in adequate amounts for the purposes at hand. Hence, when we make and offer arguments, we normally try to make them logical. This feature of communication is what lies behind the principle of charity. The idea is that since normally an author will be trying to make logical arguments, it follows that if, in interpreting a passage, we reconstruct the most logical argument we can make it out to contain, then that probably will be the argument the author intended to make. A corollary of the principle of charity is that we can take a particular passage in two ways, either as a stupid argument or as more sensibly something else, and if either makes sense in the context, then we should assign the second interpretation. Any piece of writing will approximate one of the following five models, and the principle of charity directs the associated verdict in each case. 1. The prose yields a logically good argument, and nothing in the context points against that interpretation. Verdict. Treat it as an argument. 2. The passage yields an argument that in the context there is some reason to think the author intended, but it is not a logically good argument. In that case, you have to decide between two options. A. The author did not intend to argue, in which case he cannot be made out to have argued badly, but the cost is that it is hard to make sense out of what he was intending to do, or B. The author intended to argue, in which case there is a reasonable interpretation of the function of his communication, but the cost is that he has to be taken to have argued badly. Verdict. Sometimes A, sometimes B, depending on the specifics of the communication and the context. Sometimes there is no way to decide. 3. The passage yields an argument, but only a logically bad one, and there is an alternative interpretation based on context. Verdict. Call it, not an argument, but, instead, whatever it seems to be. A joke, a piece of sarcasm or irony, simply an opinion or whatever. 4. The piece of prose might be construed to yield a partial argument or moves in the direction of argument, and the context is favorable to reading it as argumentative. Yet what is stated is so tentative or so unformed that to reconstruct an argument out of it would require, in effect, creating an argument oneself, based on the hints the author gives. Verdict. Call it proto-argument. 5. What has been said is non-argumentative. Verdict. No argument. The author is doing something besides making an argument. A word of warning. 
This is a book about arguments because it deals almost exclusively with arguments as you read it and work your way through the exercises you may find yourself inclined to see arguments under every rock and behind every tree. Perspective is important. Lots and lots of written and spoken communication, most of it, in fact, is not argumentative. People complain, crack jokes, express outrage, pontificate, praise, register observations, make snide comments, make requests, make small talk, ask questions, recommend, ridicule, stand on their dignity, pass the time of day, describe situations, tell stories, the list could go on and on, and none of this is argument. Also, as already emphasized, we are following the policy of withholding the title argument from expressions of opinion and proto-arguments. Critical judgment means discrimination in using the honorific term argument and in applying the critical apparatus that goes with it. Examples. Here are two examples, together with as much background as we have available about them, to illustrate some of the above points. All we know about this passage is that it was a letter written to a columnist for the Newark, New Jersey Star-Ledger and printed there. Dear Emily, I wish you'd write something about people who are unfeeling about pets. I've had visitors talk disparagingly about my cat and within her earshot. These same people would be highly indignant if I made a similar remark about one of their children. I can't understand such a lack of feeling. I rate. Next is a passage from Neil Postman's Critique of Television, Amusing Ourselves to Death. Postman has written in an earlier chapter that his book is an inquiry into and a lamentation about the decline of the age of typography and the ascendancy of the age of television. But there is still another reason why I should like not to be understood as making a total assault on television. Anyone who is even slightly familiar with the history of communications knows that every new technology for thinking involves a trade-off. It giveth and it taketh away. We must be careful in praising or condemning because the future may hold surprises for us. Before reading any further, decide for yourself whether these excerpts should be construed as containing arguments, then put down your reasons for arriving at your judgment in each case. After you have done that, read our verdicts in the following paragraphs. We think irate is expressing his indignation at how people can be unfeeling about pets and making a request of the columnist to whom he is writing. We don't think there is any point in trying to tease an argument out of this letter. Irate finds an inconsistency between what people do and what they expect others to do. They'll criticize your cat and hurt your feelings, but be upset if you criticize their children and thus hurt their feelings. He expresses puzzlement, or perhaps dismay, over this phenomenon. If you try to make irate out to be arguing, you have to attribute to him an argument that employs a silly analogy, namely, cats, like children, have feelings, and so just as you shouldn't insult a child, you shouldn't insult a cat. So here is a model for a situation. You have a choice between 1. Interpreting the letter to yield a bad argument, and 2. Interpreting it as not functioning to express an argument at all, but doing something else. In the context, the latter is entirely reasonable. The letter is expressing feelings and making a request. The principle of charity indicates this option. We think an excerpt from Postman's book does contain an argument. The clearest indication is the author's own words, but there is still another reason why. These words indicate explicitly that the author intends to support his claim that he should not be understood to be making a total assault on television. A second factor is the context. As the quote in the background states, Postman's book is a lament about television. We would expect, therefore, to be given a reason for any qualification of that lament, which our passage clearly is. Finally, the excerpt itself readily yields up a logically sensible argument, one which goes roughly as follows. Every new technology for thinking brings new benefits and causes the loss of benefits from the technology it replaces. Therefore, the future may reveal some hitherto unappreciated benefits of television. Therefore, it would be a mistake to claim television has no benefits. Therefore, do not understand Postman to be making a total assault on television. The argument we attribute to Postman is, 
moreover, a very plausible one. So there are several reasons to interpret this segment as containing an argument, and no reason not to. Whether we have interpreted the argument accurately, we leave to your judgment. Argument and Explanation One understandable source of confusion in identifying arguments is their similarity to explanations. An argument and an explanation are quite different nonetheless. They perform different functions. The job of an argument, as we've seen, is to present reasons for accepting a claim. An explanation, on the other hand, is used to make something intelligible or understandable. Often explanations do this by showing how the thing came about, how it came to be. Thus we get explanations that do their work by showing the cause or origin of an event or at least the factors that made the difference in its coming to be. At other times, explanations work by giving the meaning or significance or a phenomenon or event. Both of these functions of explanations are illustrated in a New York Times story about a farmer in Hills, Iowa, who killed three people and then committed suicide. The headline was, Deaths on the Iowa Prairie, Four New Victims of the Economy, and the report said the deaths were the latest in a series of violent outbursts across the Middle West caused by the depressed farm economy. The presence or absence of an attempt to support a claim is one way of distinguishing argument from explanation in practice. Ask, does the writer say anything to try to establish the claim, to show that it is true, to persuade us to accept it? If the answer is yes, you are looking at an argument. If no, then it is not an argument. And you can ask, is the writer taking the claim's truth for granted, treating it as given or as already established, and offering an account of why it is? If the answer is yes, then you have an explanation. Unfortunately, you cannot rely on premise and conclusion indicators or other terms alone to mark the argument-explanation distinction. For example, because can introduce either, and what's called a reason can be either. Further complications. 1. An explanation can be used in an argument. For instance, an explanation of why the accused could have no motive for committing the crime can contribute to an argument supporting the accused's innocence. 2. An argument can be used in an explanation. Postman's argument to show that television is probably not without benefits explains why he is not totally critical of TV. 3. There will be cases in which either interpretation, argument, or explanation seems equally plausible, or where, as in the following example, both explanation and argument occur simultaneously. Wiring in new construction is seldom a problem since all studs and ceiling joists are exposed and accessible. Here, the subordinate clause explains why wiring in new construction is seldom a problem and, at the same time, gives a reason for believing that it's seldom a problem. We grant the complications and acknowledge the difficulty of marking the distinction in certain cases, but we still contend that the two functions of arguing and explaining are conceptually distinct. It is the interpreter's task to sort the two out and to identify only arguments as arguments. Explanation. Information that is supposed to indicate the origin, cause, meaning, or significance of an event or other phenomenon. Example, she's the best tennis player on the team because she has had better coaching, is in better shape, and practices a lot more than anyone else. Argument. Information that is supposed to establish that a proposition is true or otherwise worthy of belief or acceptance. Example, she consistently defeats all her teammates, so she's the best tennis player on the team. Reading carefully. One of the payoffs of a study of argument and from practice identifying, reconstructing, and assessing arguments is that your reading will improve. You'll read more carefully, with greater attention to detail and more discrimination among different possible interpretations than you did before, because such care is necessary to identify, reconstruct, and assess arguments. We have here what's called a bootstrapping problem. To learn how to do X well, you must start by trying to X well. In other words, you have to lift yourself up by your own bootstraps. Bootstrapping problems are common and far from insurmountable. We encounter them any time we learn a skilled activity, be it entirely mental, for example chess, or mental and physical, for example golf. 
To learn to play chess or golf well, you must try to play chess or golf well. Similarly, to learn to read prose with care in order to discern with discrimination whether it contains an argument, and if so, what argument, you must begin by trying to read carefully. To be sure, the admonition, read carefully, is no more helpful to the budding argument analyst than play the piano beautifully is to the budding pianist. So we offer a few pieces of advice based on experience with miscommunication. Communication theorists have discovered that when one person, the sender, communicates to another, the receiver, the receiver is not like an empty cassette that simply records the sender's message. Instead, the message is mediated by a complex group of filters, an interacting network of cognitive and affective states that are built into the receiver. Many of these help the communication, as when they supply needed context and background meanings, but sometimes they distort the message, and when they do, the message received is not the message sent. The result is misinterpretation. A major cause of misinterpreting what others have said or written is the habit of reading into their actual words meanings that are not there. Meanings based on the receiver's expectations or on his purely personal associations with the sender's words or expressions. Our main advice about reading carefully, then, is directed to breaking that habit. If you can train yourself in your reading to distinguish the following four things, you'll be on the way to avoiding such misinterpretation. 1. What someone asserts in writing or uttering a given sentence. 2. What is consistent with what the person asserts. 3. What that assertion strictly implies. 4. What that assertion supports but does not strictly imply. To explain these distinctions, we will apply them to examples. 1. What someone asserts is what she intends to be understood to mean. It can be paraphrased in a roughly equivalent sentence. Thus, when Professor Honora O'Neill begins her book Constructions of Reason in 1989 about Kant's moral philosophy with the sentence, I start with two puzzles about Kant's account of reason. She has asserted that there are at least two puzzling or curious features of what Kant says about reason, and that she is, to paraphrase, beginning her book with a discussion of them. 2. Has Professor O'Neill asserted a. Kant's account of reason contains only two puzzles, b. Kant's account of reason is totally puzzling, c. Kant's account of reason is totally mistaken, or d. Kant's account of reason contains some mistakes, or e. These two puzzles can be explained away. No, she has asserted none of these. It's true that each one is consistent with 8, that is, if what she asserts in 8 is true, each of A to E could be true. Two statements are consistent if they can both be true at the same time. 3. One assertion strictly implies another when the second cannot be false if the first is true. For example, Proper footnotes allow the reader to check sources and to verify information implies that proper footnotes contain enough accurate information to permit the reader to find the source of the footnoted passage. Passage 9 implies passage 10 because if 9 is true, then 10 has to be true also. If proper footnotes are to allow a reader to check sources and verify information, then they must contain enough accurate information to enable the reader to locate the sources they refer to. 4. One statement can support another without implying it. A statement supports another if it constitutes a reason for believing it, even if it does not strictly imply it. Consider the following two assertions that Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky make in their book Manufacturing Consent. The mass media are drawn into a symbiotic relationship with powerful sources of information by economic necessity. Economics dictates that they concentrate their resources where significant news often occurs, where important rumors and leaks abound, and where regular press conferences are held. Now, if indeed the costs of news gathering require the mass media to locate their resources as Herman and Chomsky assert, then since capitals such as Washington, Beijing, Tokyo, London, and Paris are such locales, and these are also the centers of government power and government's distribution of information, then you can see how the mass media might be drawn into some sort of relationship with those sources.
So the second assertion supports the first, but the second doesn't strictly imply the first. It could be true that economics dictates such a concentration of media resources, yet the media are able to maintain firm arm's length relationships with powerful sources such as governments and lobbies. The first sentence could be false even if the second were true. In fact, that is exactly what some critics of the Herman Chomsky thesis maintain. Our main advice about reading carefully, then, comes down to this. When you are reading, do your best to keep track of exactly what the author asserts. Do not add to it by reading in possible interpretations, even if the interpretations are consistent with what the author asserts, and even if the author might well believe them too. Keep separate also what the assertion strictly implies. Although the author may be committed to what his or her assertions imply, it is one thing to say something, that is, put it into words, and quite another to imply it. An author might not realize what his assertions imply, and once those implications are pointed out to him, he might take back what he said rather than commit to its implications. Finally, do not attribute to the author what you think his or her assertions might support. The author might disagree or have never thought about it. Two final general suggestions about careful reading. First, keep an eye out for the premise and conclusion indicating terms noted above. Second, attend to the semantic cues we refer to in Chapter 2 in our discussion of reconstructing arguments. Summary in this chapter, we introduce the concept of argument as reasons that one makes or gives in support of a claim, thus distinguishing an argument from opinion and proto-argument, on the one hand, and from a quarrel or a fight, on the other hand. Then we took on the problem of deciding when an argument has been given in a piece of writing. We noted that the author's intentions, premise, and conclusion indicators, cues from the context, and the logical structure of the prose all can help you determine the presence of argument. We warned against seeing arguments everywhere, distinguished between arguments and explanations, and suggested how you might try to read with discrimination. Chapter 2 is devoted to techniques of rewriting and displaying the structure of shorter arguments. In Chapter 13, we introduce a method for displaying the structure of longer arguments.